Okay, where the hell were we? That's right, Article 51. And the mostly unknown fact that Ukraine started this whole mess by attacking innocent civilians, their own innocent civilians, for not much more than, well, speaking Russian. This would honestly be like us, as in the American government, supporting and funding some rogue group of fundamentalists. I imagine attacking a certain area of Texas because the Latino population there refuses to speak English and live an American lifestyle. Now, there's more to it than that, obviously, but in essence, these folks wanted to live the old way, the Soviet Union way, and the westernized wannabe libtards in Kiev or Kyiv hated that. And despite the Minsk agreements decided to aid the neo-Nazi battalions, in viciously killing the people of the Donbass. This has been going on, off and on, for almost a decade, truth be told. So, in this case, you can see where the Article 5, or the so-called Responsibility to Protect, R2P, could actually be justified. After all, by most estimates, the Ukrainian army has killed over 14,000 ethnic Russians since the U.S.-backed coup eight years ago. Now, if ever there was a situation in which a defensive military operation could be justified, this was, well, it was definitely it. But that still does not fully explain why Putin invoked UN Article 51. For that, we turn to former weapons inspector Scott Ritter, who explained it like this. Russian President Vladimir Putin, citing Article 51 as his authority, ordered what he called a special military operation. Under Article 51, there can be no doubt to the legitimacy of Russia's contention that the Russian-speaking population of the Donbass had been subjected to a brutal eight-year-long bombardment that had killed thousands of people. Moreover, Russia claimed to have documentary proof that the Ukrainian army was preparing for a massive military incursion into the Donbass, which was preempted by the Russian-led special military operation. The bottom line is that Russia has set forth a cognizable claim under the doctrine of anticipatory collective self-defense, devised originally by the US and NATO, as it applies to Article 51, which is predicated on fact, not fiction. While it might be in vogue for people, organizations, and governments in the West to embrace the knee-jerk conclusion that Russia's military intervention constitutes a wanton violation of the United Nations Charter, and as such, constitutes an illegal war or aggression, the uncomfortable truth is that of all the claims made regarding the legality of preemption under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, Russia's justification for invading Ukraine is on solid legal ground. Here's a bit more background from an article by foreign policy analyst Daniel Kovalik. One must begin this discussion by accepting the fact that there was already a war happening in Ukraine for the eight years preceding the Russian military incursion in February of 2022. And this war by the government in Kiev claimed the lives of over 14,000 people, many of them children and displaced around 1.5 million more. The government of Kiev, and especially its neo-Nazi battalions, carried out attacks against these people precisely because of their ethnicity. While the UN chapter prohibits unilateral acts of war, it also provides in Article 51 that nothing in the present charter shall impair the inherent right of individuals or collective self-defense. And this right of self-defense has been interpreted to permit countries to respond, not only to acts of armed attacks, but also to the threat of imminent attack. In light of the aforementioned, it is my assessment that Russia had a right to act in its own self-defense by intervening in Ukraine, which had become a proxy of the United States and NATO for an assault, not only on Russian ethnics within Ukraine, but also upon Russia itself." Unquote. So, has anyone in the Western media reported on the fact that Putin invoked UN Article 51 before he launched the special military operation? No. Hell no. Hell no, they haven't, because to do so would be an admission that Putin's military operation complied with international law. Nope. Instead, the media continues to spread the fiction that Hitler-Putin 
is trying to rebuild the Soviet Empire, a claim for which there is not a scintilla of evidence. Keep in mind, Putin's operation does not involve the toppling of a foreign government to install a Moscow-backed stooge. No, he's not Dick Cheney now, come on. Or the arming and training of a foreign military that will be used as proxies to fight a geopolitical rival. No matter what you hear past 5 o'clock on CNN and MSNBC, that is not happening. Nor is he stuffing a country with state-of-the-art weaponry to achieve his own narrow strategic objectives or perpetrating terrorist acts of industrial sabotage. Nord Stream 2 comes to mind to prevent the economic integrity of Asia and Europe. No, Putin hasn't engaged in any of these things. A word of advice I kind of learned the hard way. Anytime you see a general over 75 years old on Fox News, just just don't don't take his word for gospel, okay? A lot of these guys come out of the Cold War scene and, I don't know, they just don't live in our reality. At least not the reality on the ground in Ukraine right now. Okay, let me get back on track here. Where was I? Oh, Putin hasn't engaged in any of these things, but Washington certainly has, because Washington isn't constrained by international law. In Washington's eyes, international law is merely an inconvenience that is dismissively shrugged off whenever unilateral action is required. But Putin is not nearly as cavalier about such matters. In fact, he has a long history of playing by the rules because he believes the rules help to strengthen everyone's security. And he's right. They do. And that's why he invoked Article 51 before he sent the troops to help the people in the Donbass. He felt he had a moral obligation to lend them his assistance, but wanted his actions to comply with international law. And I think he achieved both. Now here's something else we'll never see in Western media. You'll never see the actual text of Putin's security demands that were made a full two months before the war broke out. And the reason you won't see them is because his demands were legitimate, reasonable, and necessary. All Putin really wanted was basic assurance that NATO was not planning to put its bases, armies, and missile sites on Russia's border. In other words, he was doing the same exact thing all other responsible leaders do to defend the safety and security of their own people. Here are a few critical excerpts from the text of Putin's proposal to the United States and NATO. Article 1. The party shall cooperate on the basis of principles of indivisible equal and undiminished security and to these ends, shall not undertake actions nor participate or support actions that affect the security of the other party, shall not implement security measures adopted by each party individually or in the framework of an international organization, military alliance or coalition that could undermine core security interests of the other party. Article 3. The parties shall not use the territories of other states with a view to preparing or carrying out an armed attack against the other party or other actions affecting core security interests of the other party. Article number 4. The United States of America shall undertake to prevent further eastward expansion of the Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization and deny access to the alliance to the states of the former Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The United States of America shall not establish military bases in the territory of the states of the former Union of Soviet Socialist Republics that are not members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, use their infrastructure for any military activity, or develop bilateral military cooperation with them. Article number 5. The parties shall refrain from deploying their armed forces and armaments, including in the framework of international organizations, military alliances, or coalitions in the areas where such deployment could be perceived by the other party as a threat to its national security, with the exception of such deployment within the national territories of the parties. The party shall refrain from flying heavy bombers equipped for nuclear or non-nuclear armaments or deploying surface warships of any type, including in the framework of international organizations, military alliances, or coalitions, in the areas outside national airspace and national territorial waters, respectively, from where they can attack targets in the territory of the other party. 
The party shall maintain dialogue and cooperate to improve mechanisms to prevent dangerous military activities on and over the high seas, including agreeing on the maximum approach distance between warships and aircraft. Okay, almost done here. Two more articles. Article 6. The party shall undertake not to deploy ground-launched intermediate-range or short-range missiles outside their national territories, as well as in the areas of their national territories from which such weapons can attack targets in the national territory of the other party. Article number 7. The party shall refrain from deploying nuclear weapons outside their national territories and return such weapons already deployed outside their national territories at the time of the entry into force of the treaty to their national territories. The party shall eliminate all existing infrastructure for deployment of nuclear weapons outside their national territories. And lastly, the party shall not train military and civilian personnel from non-nuclear countries to use nuclear weapons. The party shall not conduct exercises or training for general purpose forces that include scenarios involving the use of nuclear weapons. Okay, so it doesn't take a genius to figure out what Putin was really worried about here. He was worried about NATO expansion and in particular the emergence of a hostile military alliance backed by Washington groomed Nazis occupying territory on his western flank. So you tell me, folks, was this unreasonable from him? Should he have embraced these U.S.-backed Russiaphobes and allow them to place their missiles on his border? Would that have been the prudent thing to do? So really, what can we deduce from Putin's list of demands here? Well, first, we can deduce that he is not trying to reconstruct the Soviet Empire, as the idiots in the mainstream media relentlessly insist. The list focuses exclusively on security-related demands. Nothing else. Second, it proves that the war could have easily been avoided by Zelensky if he had simply maintained the status quo and formally announced that Ukraine would remain neutral. In fact, Zelensky actually agreed to neutrality in negotiations with Moscow in March, but Washington prevented the Ukrainian president from going through with the deal, which means that the Biden administration is largely responsible for the ongoing conflict. So RT published an article, and you'll remember RT because they got silenced and canceled, similar to the Post right before the 2020 election. Anyways, their article stated clearly that an agreement had been reached between Russia and Ukraine in March, but the deal was intentionally scuttled by the United States and the UK. Washington wanted this war, folks. Okay, so third, it shows that Putin is a reasonable leader whose demands should have been eagerly accepted. Was it unreasonable for Putin to ask that the party shall refrain from deploying their armed forces and military alliances in the areas where such deployment could be perceived by the other party as a threat to its national security? Was it entirely unreasonable for him to ask that the party shall eliminate all existing infrastructure for deployment of nuclear weapons outside their national territories? So. Where exactly are the unreasonable demands that Putin supposedly made? There aren't any. Putin made no demands that the United States wouldn't have made if the shoe was on the other foot. Okay, so fourth, this proves that the war is not a struggle for Ukraine liberation or democracy. I repeat myself, this war is not a struggle for Ukrainian liberation or democracy. That's all bullshit. This is a war that is aimed at weakening Russia and eventually removing Vladimir Putin from power. Period. Those, my friends, are the real overriding goals. What that means is that the Ukrainian soldiers are not dying for their country. No, no, no. They're dying for an elite dream to expand NATO, crush Russia, encircle China, and extend U.S. hegemony for another century. Ukraine is merely the battlefield on which the great power struggle is being fought. And on that note, I'm going to call it a day. I guess we're going to extend this out to a third episode. Are you kidding me? Well, there's a lot of details to this story. Now, isn't there? Wow, this is almost uncharted territory. I haven't done a third episode, I don't think, since about four years back when I went to the Mexico border. 
So stay tuned. I'll try to get this third one pushed out in the next 24 to 48 hours. I do have a work week starting, as most of you probably do as well. So if you liked it, hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't. Leave a comment down below. There's a PayPal link in the description box, so please put a dollar in the bucket on the way out the door. I'd like to thank everyone for all your donations. They're much needed and much appreciated. Now, with all that being said, we'll see you next time. Come on, move. Move. Easy, easy.